You may be seated. I'm going to continue today what I've been doing, financial series, financial freedom, and uh, we've already covered uh, several topics. We spent one, we talked about God's purposes for money. We spent several, we shared about what those purposes are. We talked about budgeting, somebody say budgeting. budgeting. Talked about developing budget. We talked about debt, getting out of debt. Look at your neighbor, see, did you get rid of your credit cards? Last week we talked about savings. Look at your neighbor and say, did you know that Jesus saves? Jesus. <laughs> Today, I want to talk about giving. Amen. Amen. I knew y'all would be excited about that. Thank all 17 of y'all for that rousing affirmation. This is one of, all of these messages are important and vital, but this is one that changed my life. I'm going to share this scripture that I'm going to be ministering from today. And I need to tell you that this is one of these passages of scriptures that absolutely changed my life. So much of where I am today comes from me being exposed to the scripture, getting the revelation of it, and applying it to my life. And I'm seeing the fruit of it in my life every day today. One of the things I know, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, God is no respect of persons. There's nothing that he won't do for you that he has already done for you. Now, before I go to my text, which is 2 Chronicles chapter 9, 2 Corinthians, just trying to see if y'all was paying attention. Who said that? Thank you, you're paying attention. I don't know where I got Chronicles from, I wasn't thinking about that. Uh, I, I was thinking about because Second Chronicles 16:9 is like my my most favorite verse because the eyes of the Lord looked to and fro among the whose hearts are loyal that He might prove Himself strong on their behalf. That's that's my cornerstone verse right there. That's what I was thinking about. But anyway, uh, giving. Now, I, after my first service today, I, I met a pastor in uh, South Africa, and he pastors in Texas, but. Uh, out of the blue, he sent me a text this morning, out of the blue, unknown to him what I was preaching about today, unknown to him, he sent me one on giving. That's why I know I got to talk to you all about this. That's one of the ways God works. He confirms through people who don't even know what you're trying, what you're doing or who you're talking to or whatever. And he sent me this, this text about offering, and here's what it says. Research shows that giving creates a biochemical reaction in people. The, chemical that, the chemicals that are released are the same that occur when a newborn baby is handed to the mom and she holds that child. Those chemicals flood the mom's system because at that moment, the mom is saying, I'll give anything for that child. The same chemicals are released in you when you give. And that's why some of y'all are so tight all the time. Because those chemicals are not being released. Because you're a tightwad. Go ahead, look up and down your row and see if you can figure out who the tightwads are. Proverbs chapter 11, I'm just going to read this. You don't have to turn there. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24 and 25 says this. There is one who scatters, yet increases more. In other words, there's one who scatters. That means there's one who gives, yet increases more. And there is one who, who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich. And he who waters will also be watered himself. Y'all missed a great spot to say amen. 
you know what it, it, it boils down to say is if you're a person who give, God will give back to you. Yeah. Press down, shaking together, running over. So I want to talk from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So turn your Bibles to there, to your iPhone, your iPad, or whatever you have. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want to read this to you. This, I got four points, then I'll be finished. It's 107 right now. I'm looking at the clock. I promise I'll be done by 307 or 330 at the latest. <laughs> The thing that's, that's funny to me is y'all are serious. <laughs> All right. I need to set the background for you for this passage. I need to tell you what this is about. The Apostle Paul writes, this is his letter to the church in Corinth. It's a carnal church that he's been working with to try to get them to be more spiritual. By the way, the, the title of this message is The Spiritual Significance of Giving the spiritual significance of giving. Now, I preach this message almost every year for many years. Uh, and I'm always hesitant to preach a sermon again, a message again. Uh, but it was so impacting on my own personal life that I think it's worth the while for me to talk to you about it again. I figure if the choir can sing the same song for 10 years, But you've seen, the, you've seen whatever song you learn more than once. Yeah. So it should be okay for me to preach a sermon more than once, right? Amen. I want you to listen to me as I walk down through this. I promise I'll be finished when I get done. The Apostle Paul writes this letter to the church in Corinth. And the reasons he's writing them is because the Corinthian church had promised to take up an offering for the church in Macedonia. Macedonia was a poor community with poor people, and the church in Corinth said they would help them out, and they would take up an offering. Matter of fact, if you read chapter 8, just before chapter 9, Paul talks about the Macedonian church. Here's a church that were givers, even though they were poor. As a matter of fact, at one point it says in the scriptures that they gave greater than their ability. They were such great givers. But in chapter 9, he's talking to the church in Corinth about the offering that they agreed to give. Are y'all with me so far? Yes. So the first point I want to make is the first five verses, he makes a plea. Somebody say a plea. plea. He makes an appeal to them. He makes a plea. Let's read these first five verses. Here's what it says. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, that's the offering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. It is it's not necessary. I, I don't have to do this. Is that the word superfluous is what that means. I don't have to write to you. For I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians that Achaia was ready a year ago and your zeal has stirred up the majority. He says, I, here's what he's saying. I told the Macedonians about the offering that you all were going to give, and they got excited themselves based on what you said you were going to do. Yeah. And they're excited about it. Verse 3, yet I have sent the brethren, I have sent the brethren, lest our, boist, our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me, and find you unprepared. We, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. I don't want to get there. Here's what he said. I don't want to get there. I done bragged on y'all and told them about how much y'all going to give and do for them. And I don't want to get there and it's time to take the offering and y'all ain't ready. That's right. That's right. Therefore, verse 5, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Amen. Amen. 
He says, I, I'm, I'm, I want y'all to be ready, and I'm writing to you ahead of time, so you'll be ready ahead of time, because I don't want us to get there, and I got some of these Macedonian brothers with me, and it's time for the offering, and y'all ain't ready, and y'all ain't done nothing, and y'all haven't prepared, and you haven't taken up the offering, and you didn't bring the offering to church with you, you didn't fill out the envelope, you didn't go to the e-giving thing and fill that out so it could be all set in place. He says, I don't want to get to and do all of that, and, and come to find out y'all ain't ready, and he said, by the way, I don't want you to do this out of... Uh, out of a, a grudging obligation. I don't want you to do it just because you said you were going to do it. I want you to do it out of a spirit of generosity. Yeah. And that's what would be my plea to you. I don't want you to ever give to this church out of obligation. And if you're mad about it and you've got an attitude, keep your money. that God has raised up enough people in this church who love him enough or are obedient enough that we will take care of everything we need with the people who want to give. But if you got an attitude, keep your stinking money to yourself. There's one of those stinking people on your road. Look up and down and see if you can figure out who it is. Go ahead, tell them, keep it to yourself. You're going to have an attitude. You're going to be mad about it. You're going to roll your head around on your neck. Here they go take another offering again. <laughs> keep it to yourself. That's number one. That's the plea. I make the plea. Don't give to this church or any church. I can speak to my church. Don't, this church, don't give to us if you got an attitude. Here's point number two. In verse number six, he gives a principle. Somebody say principle. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. He who sows sparingly reaps sparingly. He who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. That's a, uh, a principle. Let me talk about the key words in this verse. He who sows sparingly. Let me talk about sparingly. The word sparingly means stingy. There's some stingy people on your road. See if you can figure out who they are. Y'all not looking. I say look and find the stingy people on your road. Here's what it means in the Greek. When you stingy, it means that uh, you give what's left over. After you done paid everything else, contributed to everything else, paid all of your bills and contributed everything else, whatever you got left over, that, that's what you give to the kingdom from that pot. And the scripture says, if, you, if that's how you treat God, if you sold to his kingdom sparingly, or what's left over. When it comes time for God to bless you, it will be what's left over from his pot. Preach, Pastor. Preach, Pastor. You're preaching, Pastor. That's right. Yeah, I am preaching. Let me see that thing right there. That's right. That's right. That's my clever. I like that. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Make a noise. Let me use this for a little while. That's right. Yes, some of you, every time you come to the offering, it's $5. $5. Yeah, that's right. They're out of control at this age right here. So every time you come, it's $5. Same amount, $5. $5. Then you have a need. And you come to God, he check your history. He see you gave five dollars every time. Now you need a blessing. God say, give her five dollars. (laughs) 
some people would not allow themselves to be left clapless. I'm sorry, I didn't know that you had another clapper over here. No, I want the blue one. <laughs> It's a slapstick, too. A slapstick? And a clapper. Wow, go ahead. Let me just let you leave that to you, because <laughs> praise him. Mm. <laughs> what would God, how would you feel if God treated you the way you treated him? And that's what this text is saying. The way you treat God, your attitude and your giving and the level with which you give, what you sow is what you're going to get back. Never before have we built a culture of people who expect to put a dollar in and get a million dollars back. That's what people think. You receive back, you, you get a reward in proportion to the level of which you sow. You can't expect a whole field, a whole harvest of a field if all you gave is one seed. You can't get the whole field filled up and all you dropped in was one seed. That's what the scripture said. You give to God. God is not the lottery. This is not the lottery. This, God, it's, this is a biblical principle that works all the time. It's, this is not the lotto. It's not the lotto. And he who sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. I'm glad you asked the question. I need to talk about bountiful. What does it mean to be bountiful? It's, it, it's, the word itself is specifically talking about money. By the way, let me just be clear. Bountiful is talking about money. It is talking about money. And he who sows bountifully. The word bountiful is a Greek word, elogia. Don't... This, that's the word, it's a Greek word, elogia. It is the Greek word from which we derive the English word eulogy. Do you know what a eulogy is? A eulogy is a message that is giving. It is speaking about somebody who has died. That's what a eulogy is. So I'm, as a pastor, I've done many eulogies in my life, tons of them, do them all the time. And I can speak in one of three ways about a person who has died if I'm doing a eulogy. I either knew them very well, and I can speak very well about them because I knew them. I had a relationship with them. I, I know them. I knew them. Or I can say they were acquaintances. I didn't know them very well. Uh, I might not have even known their name, just know their face. may not know much about them, but I can acquaint that I've seen them from time to time. Or I can speak at their funeral from the basis of the fact that I didn't know them at all. I can't say much about them. When I speak about, when I do a eulogy for somebody I don't know, I don't fo focus on that person. I just preach the gospel because I don't know them well enough to speak about them. What this text is saying is when you give, you are making, you are speaking a eulogy about somebody who's died. Slow down. I'm going to give it to you for a second. I know that went over, over some of y'all's head. But your giving is a reflection of your relationship with Jesus Christ and what he means to you. Some of y'all are speaking very weak about Jesus. Your giving is, is saying, I don't have to follow you around to find out if you saved or if you know Jesus. I don't have to follow you around. All I have to do is look at your checkbook. See, some of y'all want people to believe that you've had an encounter with Jesus and he got in your head and you think differently. He got in your eyes and you look differently. You see life differently. He got in your tongue and you talk differently. He got in your heart and you love differently. He slid around your wallet. <laughs> got in your legs and you walk differently. Got in your feet and you go differently. You want us to think that God got all inside of you, got all around you and did all this stuff, but he slid around your wallet. I am preaching. I know I'm preaching. <laughs> you can't have an encounter with Jesus, the God of the universe, who made the heavens and the earth, who saved you out of your problems and delivered you from your addictions and forgave you of your sins, and you are going to be a tight wad? No. 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 Hell no. I 
I know y'all don't like this kind of preaching. I have a cussing spirit. That's my sin right there. It rises up in me sometime. I'm sorry. I apologize. But I feel so strongly about this that people want to act like they know Jesus, but their giving to his kingdom is null and void. I can't handle it. It's a problem with me. Point to me and pray for me. Say, Lord, please don't let them cuss again. Coy, point at me. Pray for me. Lord, help him, help him, help him, help him. Because when I think about the souls who claim to have a walk with God and claim to be saved and claim all of that and they are not, not supporting his kingdom, something rise up inside of me. You can't say that you have that kind of walk with God and you're not supporting his kingdom. This text says if you have a walk with him, you will, you logistically, you will speak well about him. And that's reflected in your giving. Amen. And I love the promise, I mean, I love the principle here, you will reap what you sow. If you give bountifully, God will bless you bountifully. I'm troubled by, by people who always broke. Always borrow money from people. Lord, y'all shouldn't have told me to take my time. I feel myself going down a road. Something is wrong when you all the time got to be borrowing money from people. All the time. Every day. Okay, let me roll on. Do y'all understand my point about a eulogistical statement? You... Your giving is making a statement about your relationship with him. So then, so he, he, he gives us, what was the first thing I gave you was the plea. The plea. Second thing is the, the principle. principle. The third thing he gives now is the program. How to, how to apply the principle into your life is the program. And that's in verse number seven. I'm almost finished. Verse 7, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. It's a profound verse, powerful. Let each one give. Here's what he says. Here's the program. You give with purpose. So, each one, let, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart. That's a key point. Has you, the way you purpose in your heart. I don't, I don't give to every offering. I give to the offerings, and, I, and I'm in church all the time. I, I, I'm in conf conferences and services all the time. I don't give it every offering. I give to the things that I feel a passion for and interest in, the things I want to support. And I don't expect you to give in every offering. Um, I want you to give to the things you identify with, you feel with, you want to support, and you want to see come to reality. You give out of that. You give as you purpose in your heart. Now, let me stick a pen right here. Stop. Pause. Stick, can y'all stick a pen and just pause right here for a second? This verse here says, you give as you purpose in your heart. Hold up. Hold up. Not grudgingly or of necessity. Not with an attitude. You got to have a proper attitude. Nor of necessity. I'm proud that the, 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 the duration of time I've been at this church, we've never had to take, a, take an offering out of necessity. We never had to come to you and say, we never had to come to you and say, we're about to get the electricity turned off when you take up an offering. Or we don't have enough money to uh, pay the payroll. I'll never have, we've never had to do that. And I celebrate that our church has never had to do that. And then it says, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a, a giver who has the right posture and attitude. And I'm going to come back to this point in a moment. But here's what I want to say about this verse. I've, I've heard a lot of preachers and a lot of on the radio and on television and on the internet, people who say tithing for the day, and then they go to this verse right here, verse 6. Verse 7, and say, God just wants you to give as you purpose in your heart. Eh, wrong answer. Here's why that's wrong. Right here, he's not talking about tithes. 
He's talking about an offering. You can't pull tithes into this. He's talking here, you got to put it in the context of the whole chapter. In the whole chapter, he's talking about an offering. Do you understand what I'm saying? But some people use this verse to say tithing is not for today. Let me tell you what my answer is. If it was good enough for Jesus, tithing is good enough for me. This is about your offering. He wants your offering you to be a cheerful giver. He wants you to, uh, I'm looking forward to the day, I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime, that it comes time for us to take the offering and the church breaks out in the dance and celebrates. People running all over, they're just so happy. They're just so happy, they're running around. Like I said, I don't think it's gonna happen in my lifetime. Because God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a a cheerful giver. Now I got six kids. My youngest child, John Jr., we call him Johnny, when he was young, he had a different attitude toward his father than his older siblings. So uh, if I'd asked my other kids to do something, they would hem and haw and attitude. You know. I told my oldest daughter, Sarah, one time, when she got her license, she just learned how to drive, got her license. I said, take your brother to football practice. She said, why can't you take him? <laughs> Go ahead and thank the Lord she's still alive. Come on, praise the Lord. <laughs> Give God a shout. Come on, praise him. She should have been dead. I should have took her out. I should have killed her then. <laughs> but I let her live. But my youngest son, Johnny, if I call him, Johnny, this is how Johnny would respond. Yes, yes Dad. <laughs> now, he outgrew it, but he had it for a season. <laughs> but my other kids, I call them Anna. <laughs> Anna. <laughs> Anna, I know you hear me <laughs> calling you. They had attitude, but Johnny's attitude was, yes, Dad, yes. At that point in his life, that boy could have gotten anything from me that he wanted. <laughs> and the scripture says, if you fathers know how to treat your earthly children, how much more shall your heavenly father treat you? If you have an attitude of joy and delight every time you have an opportunity to give, the scripture says God loves a cheerful giver. Somebody look at your neighbor, high five your neighbor, say, I need to be a cheerful giver. Tell me. Look on the other side, I say, I need to adopt my attitude. I need to change my posture. For God is not just about the money, it's also about your attitude. It's about the spirit with which you give. And if you're not giving it in the right spirit, in the right attitude, you negate whatever you gave. You can give a million dollars, but if you got an attitude with it, keep it to yourself. Well, no, you don't have to keep it to yourself. <laughs> give it to the church, but work out your attitude with God. <laughs> Let me give you this last point and I'm finished. The last one is verse 8, which is a promise. Y'all got the plea, principle, program. Here's the promise. It's verse 8. And God is able. Hold up, stick a pin right there. Just those four words is enough to shout about right there that God is able. But it doesn't stop there. And God is able. First of all, it's a conjunction. Y'all know what a conjunction is? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I know. Y'all want to say conjunction, junction. What's your function? Yeah. Hooking up words 
in phrases and clauses. Conjunction, conjunction. Yeah. So what that conjunction and means, he's connecting what he just said with what he's about to say. In other words, you do what he just said and you'll be able to experience the promise that he's about to say. The two go together. And God is able, look at what it says, to make all grace abound towards you. Stick a pen right there. God will make every bit of grace that you need. And God is able to make all, say all grace. Grace is God's presence and power. Grace is God giving you the power, the desire, the want to, to do what it is he's called and assigned for your hands to do. I love that about God. He says, I'll give you the grace to be everything you're supposed to be and do everything you're supposed to do. Now, I don't know how y'all feel about it, but I need God's grace in my life. I'm nothing without the grace of God. And you need the grace of God. Here's how you get the grace of God, by being a cheerful giver. This is how you get that in your life. Grace helps me to want to do the right thing. It makes me want to do the right thing. I love What I love about the grace of God is when God's presence is near you and by you, when he smears his grace upon you, he, he not only gives you the ability to do it, to what, you, what you're supposed to do and be what you're supposed to be, he gives you the desire to do it and want to do it. He gives you the want to. And he makes all grace abound towards you that you, Put that back up there. Put that back up there. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you, look at your neighbor, point them in their face, say that you, point them in their, you, he's talking about you, that you, that's you. God is no respect of persons. What he did for me, he'll do the same thing for you. Amen. Amen. And you get grace in the words of, in the, in the words of the great philosopher Oprah Winfrey, and you get grace, and you get grace, and you get grace, and you get grace. And you get grace, and you get grace, and everybody here has grace available to them that God will make all grace abound toward you. Look at there. Hold, leave that right there on the screen right there. That you always, woo, always, all the time, every day, 24 and 7, every day, every, every day, every hour, always having all sufficiency in all things. All things, all sufficiency, all grace. What else you need? I feel a shout coming on me right now. Put it back up there, please. May have an abundance. You won't have no shortage. You ain't going to be in shortage of no money. You ain't going to be in shortage of no house. You ain't going to be in shortage of no car. You ain't going to be in shortage of no will, no desire. You're going to have all grace about it that you can be sufficient, all sufficient. You have everything you need. Whatever you want to do, you're going to be sufficiently with it. Whatever you want to accomplish, you'll have sufficiency with it. You'll have everything you need to do, everything you want to do, when you want to do it, but God will make all of it available to you. Woo! Y'all don't know how to respond to good preaching. Who am I talking to today? Somebody holler at your neighbor and say, all grace. Say, all grace. All grace. Abounding. More than enough. <laughs> Extra. <laughs> Y'all, excuse me. I, I feel like shouting my, I feel like shouting. High five your neighbor. Say, I'm going to get all grace abounding toward me. Tell him, I'm about to be sufficient in everything. I'm about to have more than I need. I'm going to do a good work. God's going to help me be able to do a good work. Go ahead and give him a shout right there. Somebody say, I receive it. In Jesus' name, I accept it in Jesus' name. I'm changing.
changing my attitude. I'm changing my posture. I'm changing my mindset. I'm changing what I do because I want God's grace. Whew, man, I'm tired now. But I got enough energy to finish this sermon. All oh, great. Who am I preaching to today? Stand up. Let me pray for you. Oh, wait, 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 wait. If God convicted you to do something different, stand up. I want to pray for you. If God spoke to you, challenged you, don't just be standing up because other people are standing up. If this message challenged something in your life, I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for these honest hearts, honest hearts, honest spirits to say, Lord, I want to change. I want to have the right attitude. I want to flow in the principle. I want to be and work, work in the program. I want to, I want to have the, to give with purpose and give with the proper attitude. And Father, we want to experience the promises of your word in Jesus' name. Now pray this with me. Father, I repent of my stingy attitude and my selfish ways. I'm going to make my giving to you at the top of my priority list. And I'm going to be a giver and a sower. And I look forward to the promises that you've made. In Jesus' name, go ahead and give him a shout of praise. I know there's some people here today that are not saved and I know some people that are backslidden that are not in fellowship with you I know there's some people here today who've been deceived their eyes need to be opened I know there are people here today that don't have a church that need a church I know there's some people here today who are not sure of their salvation I know you know who they are I simply pray for you to move upon their heart to make the decision to say yes to you and yes to your will move them God to make a commitment toward you in Jesus' name, amen. Look at the person next to you and say, if the Lord was talking to you and you need to get it right, come on. I'll walk down there with you right now. Go ahead and talk to your neighbors. Talk to them. Challenge them. Say, if, you, if, you're not, if you're not right with God, come on. If you're not a member, come. If you're not sure, come. sure this is the time if you're backslid you want to rededicate this right now is the time if you're already saved but you want to join this church this is a great church for you to be a part of come right now while the blood is running warm in your veins come on and say yes to the Lord he loves you he cares about you he wants the best for your life come right now right this moment right this instant right this instant right this instant
Father, I pray for these who've come today. I pray that you would grant them what they stand in the need of. Plant them, fill them, save them, forgive them. Whatever they need, meet, it, meet that need in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen.